Good evening. My name is Stephen Reiner. I'm with the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University, and this is Science on Tap. Welcome. We all love penguins. They're cute, they walk, they waddle, they look like little people in tuxedos, and they are quite unique. We've come to sort of adore them, whether we see them in cartoons or documentaries or even in captivity. Uh, my guest tonight, um, sitting with me at the bar, is uh, Associate Professor of Ecology and Evolution, Heather Lynch, who, if she doesn't love penguins, she ought to, because she spends an awful lot of time with them. And she spends an awful lot of time with them far, far away on the other end of the earth. So welcome, Heather. Thank you. That's a and um, you were trained as a physicist. That's right. So how on earth did you get to penguins? Oh, that's a good question. So I, I was uh, a physicist as an undergraduate and went to graduate school for physics. And I think that I, I just felt that environmental science had some opportunities for people that love numbers that I hadn't really thought about when I had um, started out as an undergraduate. So I, I made the big leap from uh, physics to biology as a graduate student and ended up getting my PhD in organismic and evolutionary biology. Uh, not studying penguins, mind you, um, but there was an opportunity just as I was finishing my PhD to jump into this project that I work on now, and I, I haven't, I haven't, uh, haven't had a second thought about it since. So when did you see your first penguin? Oh, that's a good question. So my very first penguin ever, I had, um, I was just gone down to the Antarctic, and we were putting in another research program. You say that camp. as if it's going to, you know, <laughs> I know the I mall know. in Smith Haven. Exactly. And it was a long way away. And, and I, I saw this chin strap penguin and I was so excited. I was like, oh my god, oh my god, it's a, it's a penguin. And no sooner did I see this chin strap than it leaped off this cliff and dove four or five feet down, landed on its head on the sharpest rock you can imagine, and then tumbled down the rest of the cliff. And I was like, oh my god, that, that, that penguin just died. Like my very first penguin that I ever saw just died in front of my eyes. And, and the people that I were with, you know, old, old hats, this, they were like, eh, it'll be fine. And sure enough, I, I look at it, and it jumps up, and it <laughs> shakes its head, and, uh, and it jumped right in the ocean as if it had never happened. And it was just, I think, uh, a testament to how, how, how rugged these guys are out there. Yeah, they're tough little buggers. Oh, man. That, it, I think that is their defining feature above anything else. Right. Okay, well, we'll get back to what chin strap means. Yes, exactly. And uh, you mentioned it. You gave away the answer to the next question, but uh -oh. that's okay. Where do you go to spend these, t spend all the time with penguins? Right. So we go. To, so most people don't think of this, but um, penguins are not necessarily Antarctic birds, although we study them in the Antarctic. So the three species that we study are in the Antarctic, and in fact, where we go to study is is this the Antarctic Peninsula. Well, let's just take a look at that map because it's a little bit. I learned a little bit about Antarctica in talking with Heather, and we're going to give you the sign. Uh, which is which is the fist and the thumb, exactly. Which is Antarctica, and Heather spends her time in the thumb, which uh, it's not the Antarctica necessarily that we think of when we think of Antarctica is unbelievably cold and white and snow covered and frigid. Tell us about that particular part of the Antarctic sure. and why it's interesting. If it, if we could drain the oceans, we'd see it's actually just part of South America. And so we have this chain of land that goes through the tip of Patagonia, goes through what's called the Scotia Arc, so this chain of islands, much like Hawaii, all the way down, and then um, reaching the Antarctic Peninsula. And in many ways, it is like an extension of Patagonia. It's it's much milder climate, it's much wetter, and it's where the vast majority of, of Antarctic wildlife, as we think of it, lives right there on the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, as opposed to the dry, desolate, you know, white desert of the continent proper. Now, around the world, how many species of penguins are there? Depending on who's counting, 17 or 18 species. 17 or 18. Yep. We're we're very familiar with the, was it the Empire? The Emperor, yep. The Emperor Penguin, which was, I suppose, made most famous in the March, March of the Emperors, yep. March of the Penguins. But in this part of the world, there are three species. And we're going to take a look at them as you tell us what they are. Exactly. So I will say that there's actually four in the Antarctic. The one that we're actually, we don't study is the emperor penguin. So that's the one that people are most familiar with. And we study three of the smaller species, uh, and they're all very closely related. So we've got the Adelie penguin here, which is the classic tuxedo penguin that we're all familiar with. We've got the chin strap. As you'll notice, it's got this black uh, strap under its chin. It's where it gets its name. 
And then the last is the Gen 2 penguin, um, which uh, are the most likely to see if you uh, if you see penguins in a zoo, it's often uh, the Gen 2 penguin. Are they are they approximately the same size? They're approximately the same size. The Gen 2 is a little bit on the on the bigger side, um, but they're all about yay big in real life. And how much do they weigh usually? I think of them as being like a house cat. They weigh like a house cat. And do they have much more in common than they have differences? They do. These birds, uh, they're all very closely related. Um, they have very similar life history. So they, they both, they all lay two eggs. They breed at the same time. They're all quite mate, mate faithful. They're all quite sight faithful. And they all breed along the Antarctic Peninsula where we, where we work. What is so amazing about penguins? Why are they an amazing creature? What are the, some of the things they do, the way they live their lives? Sure. So actually, you know, if, if all you know about penguins is from March to the Penguins, every, I won't say everything you know about penguins is wrong, but the, the, the emperor penguin is a really unusual species. And these species are much more typical for penguins generally. So they breed in the, in the summer, so the Antarctic summer, which would be starting around October, November, um, our time. Um, they uh, are marine birds. They don't need land, except they need land to breed. So when they're, they're ready to breed, maybe three or four years old, they'll come back to land. They do all their breeding activity on land, and as soon as their breeding is done and their chicks are, are fledged and out at sea, they will also go out to sea. And so they don't, they don't, they really are marine birds. That's where they want to be. That's where they, that's where they spend their lives. They really only come up for this fairly short period of time where they actually have to build a nest on land. And when they go out to sea, we don't know a whole lot about what they do. No, we don't. Um, it's incredibly hard to put uh, trackers on penguins because they're so hydrodynamic that even the tiniest trackers that we can develop now still cause drag. And so we can develop trackers that you actually have to retrieve the tracker back, which means you have to find that very same penguin next year. So even if you'd inject hard. a chip or something, then good luck finding it again. Exactly. So you can inject a chip and you might build like a, an RF tag that you'd use for a cat or a dog. You might be able to scan it. But that means you've got to find that one penguin that you tagged last year. They all look identical <coughs> and try and find that one, that one penguin. So we have very few tracking studies, um, a handful, a couple dozen, um, that would actually tell us anything about what these birds do when they're not on land. So for large periods of the penguin's life, they're off, how far m might they travel? Oh, hundreds of miles, maybe more, um, offshore, uh, particularly in the, in the Antarctic winter, where the sea ice is expanding, and they sort of follow that ice edge out, and it depends um, how far the sea ice goes that, that they will follow that ice edge. And they, they're also visual foragers, so they have to follow the daylight. They can't, they can't find food when it's 24 hours darkness. So they're kind of chasing the light as well. OK, but when they come back to yeah. breed, that's when you that's what spend we can time with them. So what is a day in the life of a penguin when he or she is hanging out? Right. So when, when, when we see them, they're, they're building nests. They spend this short period of time where they're building nests. And then they will, um, the male and the female will take turns incubating that nest. So maybe, you know, a day for her, a day for him, back and forth. And then eventually those chicks will be so big that the, the chicks will all ha hang out on land and both mom and dad have to go find food together. Now when you say a nest, because of where we are, yep. we're not talking about twigs and branches and all sorts of stuff that we may find in a bird's nest here. That's right. These nests, and I think we have a picture, these nests are made out of they what? are made out of... Oh my God, they're moving. They are moving. So this is actually a, a video. Um, it's uh, slightly sped up here, but you can see this is a, a, a Gentoo penguin colony. You can see these these stone nests that they construct. And you can see kind of on the left-hand side here um, what is very typical stone-stealing behavior among penguins. So if, if stones are the currency of penguins, um, while one penguin is incubating the nest, the partner will try and steal stones um, which is cheaper than or easier than actually going to find a new one. It's better to steal one from your neighbor. And so there's a lot on this left-hand side um, uh, of, of an individual that's going to its neighbor, snagging a stone when they're not being watched, and going back and adding it to their pile. And inevitably, while they were gone, un and the nest was not as well defended, somebody else was stealing a stone from their nest. And so it, 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 it it all averages out in the end. But it's, <laughs> is this adjudicated in any way? I mean, oh, or yeah. or it just sort of is chaos. It's anarchy. Uh, it's a bit of anarchy, but they do, um, you know, they do defend their turf, and that's why uh, they're not any closer than they are about a meter apart here. Um, if, if they get much closer than that, then they can actually they can actually snap at each other from a sitting position, right? And you don't want someone, uh, another penguin to be able to, to bite at you. And so they're just far enough away that if your penguin is sitting on its nest, it can't actually get at you. And that's just, you know, that, that keeps good neighbors. 
Okay, now just in case you're wondering, all right, so you're down there and you're looking at all these penguins and you're watching them, observing them, but what really is Heather and her intrepid band doing? And you might be surprised to know that what you're doing is? Very low tech. I will say we, we count penguins as Count what we do. penguins and stay awake doing it. So oh, that's hard. People walk around counting penguins and to most of us here, and this is you. This is, this is, a, this is a GoPro that I put on my, on my head and that's my graduate student Katie Foley uh, at Stony Brook University and we're discussing here um, how to divide up the colony and you can see I'm actually just counting it with my pencil. Sometimes we have clickers like you'd use to go into a sporting event or something, but here this is a small Now, group. with all due respect, they kind of look all alike. They do, yeah. but luckily so, we're counting nests, not penguins, so the nests don't move. And by the way, those wool bumblebee gloves are state of the art Antarctic scientist gloves that you picked up in at Target, at on, the Target the on the way to the airport. They're not REI or Patagonia no. or LL Bean or anything. Those have two field seasons. Right. So those are, that's not a bee. Those are bumblebee gloves. That's Heather's hand. And she's counting the penguins. And that's what one we do. by one by one. We do. We literally count them. And that's what I think is hard to imagine because this is just a tiny part of this, this colony. Um, people say, oh, you, maybe you count this little group and then you extrapolate to the rest. And it's like, no, no, we count them all. So we're going to get to how many there are. That's right. And whether they're going up or going down or both. Right. But uh, aside from stealing one another's rocks in one another's nests, yep. they don't get into f bad fights over this. They don't oh, they do. They do, but, yes. but they don't kill one another particularly. It's not sort flesh of a wounds. flesh wound. So it's, no. it's not one of these things where, like other creatures, where no, the no, male or the female like the, comes the and dominates. Seals that are but just... they do have enemies. They do. Even down oh, there. Yeah. So, and the enemy is, oh, ah, that's an enemy. As do penguin counters. So this is me. Um, you can see some of the hazards of the profession. Um, so there are two aerial predators in the Antarctic uh, that are of concern. One is the brown skua. Um, and the closely related South Polar skua, and the other would be the Southern Giant Petrel. Now, now these make sounds. Oh, they do. And that, if you could, if you, if there was sound on that picture, you would hear this, this horrible I'm, screeching I'm, sound. I'm hoping you're going to give I, a little. I, it's like it's okay. super high pitched, and um, there is nothing worse when you've just counted like, you know, 407, 408, to have a bird fly at your head, just causing you to flinch. And you open your eyes, and now you have no idea where you are. And you've got to start all over again. And that, that happens a lot. They are much bigger than they look in these photos. I will say there's an exhibit in the American Museum of Natural History. And they are so big. And when my husband and I saw the exhibit, he says, I can see why you come home talking about skuas, because those are giant. And they have a big hooked bill that's a little hard to see on the photo. So they're much scarier, I will say, in person than, uh, than you can see here. But the penguins are obviously not happy. Um, because these birds will go after their eggs and they'll go after chicks. I'm pretty large chicks as well. Wow. You've been to Antarctica, you told me, 15 times? Probably, back and forth, over 11 years. Okay. How do you get there usually? So we actually, um, we leave from boats leaving from Ushuaia or uh, Punta Arenas. So right on the tip of, of South America, either Argentina or Chile. And we take boats from there to the Antarctic Peninsula. And about 90% of the work we do is off cruise ships, off commercial cruise ships that cruise ships. people would take for vacation. So it's like love boat. Exactly, right. except s smaller. So it's pretty cushy. It is, yeah, it's quite nice. Um, this is the, the national. So this, so this look at this, this, this idea of these intrepid, dedicated scientists living this austere, ascetic <laughs> life <laughs> is really a myth. And what you're doing, you're going, you're doing the limbo, you're doing the, uh, going God, to the buffet, no. you're going dancing, um, you're doing all this stuff on these boats. We, 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 we do have a great time. I will say that uh, in lieu of, on these ships, in lieu of having limbo. It looks like a fun crowd right we, there. You have scientists to talk to. So we, that's the role that we play is for the entertainment. And, um, but we do, we do have fun. Um, we've worked with a number of companies, including National Geographic and One Ocean Expeditions is our current partner. Um, but they're wonderful opportunities. These Antarctic ships are much smaller, and so there's a better chance to meet with the crew, work with the, you know, um, talk to the staff. I mean, if you've ever been on a cruise ship, you know no one's allowed on the bridge. And uh, these Antarctic ships allow you to break those rules so you can be up front and see the sea ice and see the wildlife. Well, this indeed does not look like the sumptuous ships we see in the ads on no, television. No, not at all. So, they're, so even on a, quote, cruise ship, there are some, there's a price to pay. What are some of the 
um, difficulties that you might encounter on one of these ships? On a ship, well, the biggest difficulty we run into is, of course, the ocean. So we cross the, the roughest stretch of water in the world, the Drake's Passage, um, which is, uh, can make the crossing no fun. And we will, we've had 40, 50 foot seas uh, going back and forth uh, from South America to Antarctica, um, which is pretty rough. And even for the large of these ships, that, looking out from the ship, your little ship is going up a mountain of water, and then it's going down a mountain of water, and then it's going up a mountain of water, and going down, and if you, this, we're in a yacht club, so this is appropriate, when we're going down the mountain of water, the whole prop is out of the water. So this giant cruise show, this prop is, it didn't, as, you know, it goes in. So you can kind of imagine the scale. So my, my theory is that you, everyone loses 20 IQ points when they step on a boat. Um, because there, but there's something about the rocking and the motion of these ships that just precludes careful thought. And so, so we kind of have to develop strategies so that we don't, uh, we can still do quality science under difficult right. conditions. But the quality science, the counting, the calculation is not only done one by one with a clicker, obviously. That's right. We've got so, there we have a, this is a drone you said or a satellite picture? Uh, so this is a drone uh, photograph. You can see if we zoom in and then uh, keep zooming in, eventually we see these tiny little black dots and each one of these black dots is in fact a nesting penguin. And then we can go ahead and we count, we can see all the little pink dots one by one, all the penguins in those images. And we can um, get really excellent counts with this drone imagery. And we also use a lot of satellite imagery as well. And so we, we have this coordinated strategy of both the ground counts and the drone counts and the satellite imagery counts as well um, to try and get the best estimate possible for some okay. of these colonies. Okay, so let's go to the um, let's go to the the big question. Yeah. What are your counts? What are you finding out about these three species based upon your counts? So we've got we've got a mixed bag, and I think that that's sort of the the subtle lesson of climate change or environmental change generally is that it's not a simple picture. And we've got one species, the Gentoo penguin, which is sort of the biggest of those three, that we call, it's just a massive climate change winner. I mean, these are like the- A winner a of winner. climate change. And these are like a, they're like the coyotes of the Antarctic. They'll oh. eat anything. They'll, they're much more flexible in terms of breeding and they'll, they'll relay their nests. And they're just, they're just really, excellent colonizers of new territory and their populations are, are booming. They're actually growing quite rapidly. And the numbers at the moment are? There are 387,000 pairs. So not that many actually, it's, this, it's by far the least. So numbers. almost 800,000 about penguins. Eight, about 800,000 penguins, which is a which lot. Is actually, it's a lot, um, but, but pales in comparison to the other two, uh, which are the Chinstrap and the Adeli. And there's about, um, four million, actually we don't know how many chin straps there are, uh, but there are about 3.8 million breeding pairs of Adelis. Um, but so, eight million, nine million, eight million. maybe more. Um, and their populations are by and large declining on the Antarctic Peninsula. And I would not say throughout all of Antarctica, because it's quite complicated, but certainly declining on the Antarctic Peninsula. So on this little strip of land where we're doing all our work, we've got one that's just booming. I mean, literally every time we go down, we find them breeding in, in new places. It's like, oh, I didn't know you were there, you know? And then <laughs> suddenly there's 20 this year, there'll be 200 next year. Um, and then we've got two that are really declining quite rapidly. In some places, losing 50, 60, 80%. So, so a mixed bag, some are going up, some are going down. Yep. The question, of course, is why? Right. And it leads to the question, which is mixing birds. The metaphor is, are penguins canaries in the cold mine? Right. Um, are they, what are their population figures telling us about the world right. and about what's happening to that part of the planet? Right. And so by extension, what might be happening elsewhere? We certainly do think of them as being canaries in the coal mine, in part because understanding anything about the Southern Ocean, I mean, if you think about you know, where we started with that big picture of Antarctica and then this giant ocean around it, there's almost nothing, there's very little that we know about anything below the water surface. That's just incredibly hard to study. Penguins are in fact one thing that is pretty reasonable to study because they actually come back to these colonies year after year after year, and so at least you know where to go to find and count them. Um, but, but everything below the ocean we know very little about. So we can actually use the penguins, which depend on those ocean resources, to say, well, if the penguins are increasing and decreasing, maybe that's telling us about this sort of the mystery of the, you know, the ocean. And there are not many species that can do that, that hang out no. above ground that on the colonial. land. That are colonial, that's the that, key. That, that yep. stay together. That's, that are colonial so we can actually know where to count them because if they were just all scattered all over the Antarctic, we'd never be able to find them. But I can tell you, 
I can tell you to the meter, you know, where these colonies are going to be from one year to the next. So we can go precisely back and count that very same population. So there are three possible oh, factors right. yes. as so to why the population why. changes. Exactly. So the, the big three suspects here, one is tourism. So what are, tour and there's more and more tourism down there. You're telling me there are more flights down there. Yes, so there, there, there is more and more tourism. This is a great, um, great photograph of the um, welcoming committee. So I, uh, the Chamber of Commerce, I think that is. Exactly. Um, so most people, um, when, I'm, when, I'm, when I'm teaching classes on seabirds or, or what have you, I always have the students uh, guess, and I, I won't quiz you, but most people don't realize that there are about 40,000 people that go to the Antarctic every year, um, which, is, which is a large number on about you know, 40 or 50 different uh, vessels, uh, which means that some of these populations, some of these penguins literally see four or 500 people every day for four months, um, because those are particularly popular landing sites. And none of us would want to do that, pretty much. I would no guess. one wants to be stared at by 500 people no. every day. Um, and so that was a big concern, you know, right. is the disturbance from tourism causing declines in reproductive success? Um, but, but by and large, um, you know, I was open to any interpretation of the data, and we spent about a decade looking at this, but we just don't find any evidence that, that tourists are really having and, a negative impact. And these are pretty environmentally conscious tourists. Excuse they're me. not going to be coming with bags of... No, the, the, the restrictions are, are... Cheddar cheese goldfish. Exactly. Right. No, they, okay. are, they, are, uh, they are very well-run operations, by and large. Um, and I will say that the plus side of these penguins is that they're very easily habituated. They're very habituatable. And habituation of wild populations is itself an impact. Um, but if we set aside the impact of habituation, it means that the penguins that are visited by 400 or 500 people a day can sort of get on with their business. And there are places where, where um, you know, there's a little post office in the Antarctic that the, the British run. And sometimes a penguin will nest on the stair ramp up to the post office and they might have 400 people step over it every day and it doesn't move so the, the, the that's not that's not the town drunk or anything no that's just, that's that's just a that's normal old penguin taking a nap normal old penguin but we do visit sites that don't see tourists and their behavior is very different so we know that there is we can really see evidence of this habituation and whether that's a good thing or a bad thing I don't know, but it does mean that it doesn't have a, a significant decline in reproduction. So there's success. no negative impact. So tourists, yeah. not a big factor. Not a big factor. So what is, we have two. Yeah, two left, right, two, two Possible ones. suspects, two and suspects. The next one is that they, there may not be enough food to eat. They eat krill, Antarctic krill, um, which looks like here, it looks just like a, a shrimp. It's not a shrimp, but you know, uh, to first approximation, they do they do look like a shrimp. They're much skinnier and scrawnier. Like you'd return it to the sh kitchen, like if you got this in your salad. But um, they uh, they're pretty much the base of the entire Southern Ocean food web. So the the whales is eat it, and the seals eat it, and the penguins eat it. And where do the krill live? Where do they hang out? So they they by and large they sort of hiding out under the sea ice, and so they they feed on um, algae that sort of grows on the underside of the sea ice. And they use the sea ice for protection against uh, predators that would, that would eat the krill. And so, you know, they absolutely need sea ice. And that's one of the big concerns. There's a couple of concerns with krill, um, one relating to, to climate change. Um, but the, the other is that we're fishing out a lot of krill. So there's a very active krill fishery. Why do we, why do we fish krill? So, so there's two main uses of it. One is in pharmaceuticals. Actually, some of you here might be uh, taking um, krill oil supplements, so it's an alternative to fish oil, and you can get Anybody that. taking krill oil? <laughs> Don't be embarrassed. Oh, we've got one. It's Who? All right. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's an alternative to fish oil. Um, it's fish Stop oil. it. <laughs> Using these, uh, these massive... Um, trawlers uh, like like this one here. Um, this is not a, a front page of the New York Post, which it kind of looks like. <laughs> no, and, and, and killer I, krill. And I and I will uh, and I will say to, to their credit, um, Ocker, uh, Biomarine actually we we've, we've just signed um, an agreement to to collaborate with them um, because they too want to know whether or not the the krill that they're fishing is having an impact on the penguins. So I'm, I'm not uh, and whether it's diminishing because it's going to affect their business obviously. Right. And, and to their credit, they are partnering with scientists to try and get an answer to it. The issue is, of course, that these boats literally vacuum the ocean up. I mean, we this is not you know a um, just a net. This is literally sucking in an entire you know, bay and filtering out the krill. And so they've just become a so huge amounts of efficient. these tiny creatures. But, 
I'll just say that there's a considerable amount of scientific uncertainty as to whether or not that bay, if you imagine that bay stays empty for an hour, you know, before the ocean turnover brings back more krill, or a week or a month. Penguin biologists are still still disagreeing. You know, I disagree with my colleagues on some of these issues. You know, how important is the krill fishery? And in, until we can, you know, as, as we're starting to do, get these krill companies on board to really look at this issue, I think, um, I think that's the only way we're going to make okay. headway. Which leaves? Climate change. So the other issue, which is related to the issue of krill, is that of climate change. Um, not only is the, as the climate is warming in areas where it is warming, and it's warming on the Antarctic Peninsula, um, it's causing a, a decline in sea ice concentration and extent. There's just less sea ice, it's thinner and so forth, but there's just less habitat for the krill. And we know that, you know, if there's no habitat for the krill, there's going to be no krill, there's going to be no penguins. Um, but it also has... Yeah, now, oh, now, yeah, now just, to, just to see how complicated things are, it's warming on the Antarctic Peninsula, which is the area in blue, yep. but the area in red, something else is happening. That's right. So when people talk about climate change in Antarctica, uh, I mean, in a way, that question doesn't even make sense, right? Because Antarctica is just this massive continent. And what we have is, is areas where it's warming and the sea ice is declining. Okay, that's sort of the classic climate change story. And then we have other areas, though, where it's getting colder, or maybe it's sort of stable or getting a little bit colder, but the sea ice is actually expanding. And so people will say, well, I, I hear that Antarctica sea ice is expanding. So much for climate change. What we have is a massive negative and a big positive, and it turns out that the net of that is actually probably positive. But that just means you've got two different flavors of climate change going on at the same time. And, and, and so the, the area where we work on the Antarctic Peninsula, the, it's, it is warming rapidly. It's one of the fastest warming areas in the planet. Um, Midwinter temperatures in that region have already increased 9 degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, 9 degrees Fahrenheit. In, in what period of time? Uh, since 1946 or so. So, in, you know, the last 75 years, we've already seen a warming, a midwinter warming that just is many, many times what we're worried about. Uh, it's the fastest warming area on the planet. You one up. Yep. One so it's, I think it's top three. Um, so not only is it warming super rapidly, but you can imagine, like I said, the temperatures are only hovering around 32 degrees, right? Well, 31 degrees, you get snow. 33 degrees, you're getting rain. So you're Which just, is nasty. Which is horrible for the um, it's bad for researchers and it's bad and for And we penguins. see a very sad photograph. I mean, here's a, a penguin completely covered in the muck, not just sitting there sort of it's shivering. It's okay, you can all go, Aww. Oh, I know, it is sad. Um, but this is what can happen when these penguins just get too wet and too muddy and they just, they can't thermoregulate um, under those conditions. You were to put a penguin in, in two feet of snow and they'd be happy as a clam. But that, that this wet rain right at this stage before they get their waterproof feathers can be, it really is a killer. And that's why the peninsula is kind of in this dangerous area where even a couple of degrees warming really pushes you right into that rain, um, that rain uh, zone. Um, so I'm curious, how, how long do you do this? How much of your life, your intellectual life, your professional life, your scientific life, you can count penguins for the rest of your life. I, I will. I, I and you think you will? I probably will. Um, huh. I mean, okay. That, I think that... I thought you said I'd give myself five more years to count penguins and then I'm no, off to something else. No, that's because they're always changing. And so that's just it. You just, just about now, we're finally starting to wrap up last season's data and we're buying plane tickets to get back down there in, in the middle of October. So every year brings new surprises. Um, some years we go down there and we, we discover penguins in places we, we never knew they could be. Or we look at the satellite imagery that's happened recently. We discovered a colony, one of the biggest colonies in the world. No one ever knew it was there. It wasn't on any maps we had. It, it, it was never known to exist. And we found it in satellites. And we're able to, to actually get there on the ground and confirm that this was, in fact, one of the largest penguin colonies in the world that no one even knew existed. And so I don't think we'll ever fail to be surprised. And that's just it. It's, it's, uh, you scratch, it's like scratching off another lottery ticket. You go down, and you never know what you're going to find. So, I mean, if trend lines continue, yep. sooner or later, yep. one of those species is going to diminish to a really significant point. So I think that the big, the, the big risk is not necessarily that we'll, we'll have any go extinct. But we definitely think that the Antarctic Peninsula here is going to be um, no longer within the range, certainly of the Adelie penguin. So the Adelie penguin. The Antarctic Peninsula is only sort of marginally good for them. They're a true Antarctic species. They like it cold. They like snow. Um, 
So the peninsula, their range is going to shift, and it's going to shift in a way that Adelis just aren't on the peninsula anymore. Um, so it doesn't mean that there won't be core areas of the continent where they continue to thrive, but it's not going to include the places that we can get to easily. And we'll, um, so I think that's the, the issues that we're seeing major shifts in, in their range, where they're breeding, rather than a concern necessarily that they're going to vanish anytime soon. Now we have an extraordinary photograph uh, because we all know about CGI, computer generated images, and you look at the George Lucas movies or the J.J. Abrams Star Wars movies and they can put 12 billion people in a scene where there's really nobody. But these are not computer images. These are real penguins that yeah. are filling the landscape, it seems, ad infinitum. So, um, so this actually is on, you know how I said that there's, there's this chain of islands that sort of connects the peninsula to Patagonia. And that chain of islands, in its furthest east extent, has a chain of islands called the South Sandwich Islands, which are one of the most poorly surveyed places on the planet. It also happens to have uh, one of the densest concentrations of penguins in the world. Um, this is uh, Zavodovsky Island, which is in the South Sandwich Islands. And this is a, a, a mix of uh, macaroni penguins and chinstrap penguins. They're all mixed in there together, but probably you know, all told about a million breeding pairs. I was going to ask you about the aroma because uh, odor, not aroma, because there's a lot of guano. You think about two million penguins, oh. right? Think about it. Oh, no, the, the clothes that I use in the field, they come home, they go in a bag, never to be opened again until I go back to Antarctica. Um, but it's, it's, it, it, the guano can be knee deep in places towards the end of the summer, and you can smell them a mile out at sea. Um, so they, they so these cruise ships can get a little gamey, you know, by the time it's finished. Oh, especially our cabin. Any, any questions? Yes. Do you know if they mate for life or how they find the same mate each year? So it's a great question. So they, 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 they mate for life about as well as we mate for life, which is that they certainly <laughs> in, intend to mate for life. Um, but they, so divorce rates from year to year might be 10, 15%. So they, they are monogamous. Serially monogamous, um, but, but these are no-fault divorces. Yeah, exactly. Um, just, just want to check. They, they do. Uh, how they find each other year to year is a great question. So one of the things we're looking at are um, acoustics. How do they talk to one another, and, and what are they saying? Um, the gentoo penguin, in particular, one of its strengths is that it's, it doesn't migrate in the winter. It stays at the colony, and we think that that allows them to stay with their partner year round. And so it's easier for them to pick up and move somewhere else because they're together. So other penguins, if you've got the male and the female and they go migrate out to the ocean, the only way they're going to find each other is to go back to the place where they were last year. But if you're together all year long, you know, I'm anthropomorphizing a bit, but that gives them a chance to pick up and move together to a new location that might be better. Do the three breeds go in separate areas on the island to breed? Oh, great question. So the question is, do the three species breed in the same places on the island? We have this, this idea that they sort of stagger according to elevation. So you've got your low-lying gentoos, and then you've got your adelis, and then you've got your cliff-climbing uh, chin straps. By and large, I think that that's probably true, but there are some islands where all three nest together, and the, chin, and the, the gentoos, which are supposed to be down here in the, in the flatlands, will be found at the very top. Do they have different ways of breeding, organizing in each of these areas? Not really. Um, they, have, they have slightly different requirements for nests. So the gentoos, you know, they like to build these giant, um, you know, we call them sort of the McMansion nests, right? These enormous nests, and they like to live on the flatlands. The chinstraps, they, they're cliff dwellers, so if they only have, you know, a token pebble, they'll, by and large, they could lay two eggs just in a little, you know, crack in the cliff. And so I think that it's really their nesting requirements that um, kind of has them staggering out. Um. Is there any evidence that there's any sort of pecking order or one species thinks it's superior to the other or bigger, stronger, smarter? Well, I think that the gentoo is the, it's the gentle giant, so it is the bigger one, but I, I think that it, it tends to be gentler, whereas the, uh, the chin strap and the adeli, I think, are feistier, so they, they all hold their own. But no, there's not one that clearly wins out, and a lot of it has to do with who, who gets that nest is the, the one that arrives the earliest. Um, so we, we think so it's first come first serve exactly yes sir how do you differentiate from different penguin species for the satellite imagery oh boy how do we differentiate them Good in the question. satellite? that's a great question so one of the things that works in our favor is that penguins are always found in the same places so if I know that this particular area you know oh this table is always gentoos looking from satellites I can see the guano there and I by and large don't have to 
I don't have to reinvent the wheel every year. I know that if I see guano in this area, that that guano is associated with gentoos. Um, because they, they'll go back to the same nest site within even a, a meter of where they were, centimeters of where they were. They build a pile of stones and they'll find that pile of stones next year. And so After being out at sea. After being out at sea, exactly. So well, that in, in a way is, I mean, single one of the oh, single most extraordinary. It's a, it's crazy, and and so we find we know from historical imagery, for example, from the 40s and 50s when they were first surveying some of these areas, we can go back. Those penguins are in the exact same places now. I mean, it's different penguins because their their lifespan isn't that long, but those colonies are in the exact same places now that they were 70, 80 years ago, and so that helps us out in the satellites. We need to ground truth at first to be like. Adelie's over here, Gentoo's over there. But after that, we kind of know what the Adelie and Gentoo areas are. And when they're nesting all together, like, like in this particular area, it becomes very difficult. And that's when I throw up my hands and I say, unknown species, and I try and get a grant to go count them uh, in person. You talk about life expectancy. How long do they live, the different species? Oh, boy. So, so I would say the maximum lifespan in the wild would only be about 15, 16, but the average penguin probably only lives one or two years because you've got a huge amount of mortality in that first year. You know, 80% might die in that first year. Among those that survive, they might live to be 8, 10, 12, but when you average it all together, the average lifespan is actually really low. We know from captive penguins that they can live and continue to breed into their 40s. Um, so they can, they can live a very long time in captivity, but in the wild, they, they, they usually succumb to their, one of their other predators, which are leopard seals in the water. Eventually, a leopard seal is going to get them. You mentioned in passing, you're going to apply for a grant. So I'm yes. just curious, who's paying for your research? Yep. Is it increasingly difficult to get money? Uh, is it increasingly difficult to make that argument why your research not someone else's right. or the importance. Just tell us about that sure. part of your life because that's the, in many ways, the lifeblood of any research scientist is sure. someone has to sure. so pay I, for it. What I should have said at the, the outset really is that the, the work that I do is in collaboration with an NGO called Oceanides. And so it's a really nice partnership between an academic institute and an NGO. And so together we do all the science and the policy and the education work. Although uh, with my lab leading the science and then Oceanides leading some of the other components so collectively, this project is called the Antarctic Site Inventory. And it was, there's three, three pots of money, all about cover a third. Um, some is, is NSF, NASA, big federal National grants. Science Foundation. National Science Foundation, exactly. About a third of it comes from uh, philanthropic foundations, like the Tinker Foundation or the Pew Foundation or some of these large uh, philanthropic organizations. And then about a third uh, of the money comes from individual private donors. And so we raise money just like World Wildlife or the Nature Conservancy. Um, by and large, it's people that are donating that have sailed with us in the past that see the value of what we do and they, they donate in our annual fundraising campaign. And it's really been the private donors that have made, I should say, the public, you know, everyday citizens that have made this possible because it's not easy to sustain a long-term program on three-year federal grants. You just can't do it. You can't collect 20 years worth of data three years at a time. And so it's really been the money that we get from the public who thinks that this is important that allows us to sort of bridge uh, the money that we might get from the, the big programs like the National Science Foundation. Okay, we have time for one or two more questions. Anyone else? How long can a penguin stay underwater without coming up for air? Oh, that's a good question. How long can they stay underwater without coming up for air? Um, gosh, minutes. Although it, it, it um, more for some of the species that are deeper diving. So the much bigger uh, king penguins and the emperor penguins, um, they dive very deeply and they can stay underwater longer. Yeah. Okay. Yes, young lady. My question is, for those of us who don't go on these uh, Antarctic cruises, how do we find out more about the penguins and your research and, and what's going on with this project? Oh, that is a great question, my favorite question. Um, so the, the, the NGO that we collaborate with is Oceanides, which is the genus name of the Wilson Storm Petrel. Not that that will help you remember it, but it help, might help you figure Ocean out Ocean I-D-E-S. I-T-E-S. I-T-E-S. But I will say that we've just launched a new application called penguinmap.com, which is even easier to spell. And penguinmap.com is our new effort to make all penguin data available to the public. It's open source, um, e easily searchable. So we hope that, that kids will use it for school projects. The, the policymakers will be using it to uh, try and understand what sustainable catch limits are. So it's really our effort to make publicly available all the data that in the past has only been known by experts. So this has been a huge project now to, to put this online and we, we just launched it um, maybe a month or so ago. 
Um, but uh, can you crowdsource penguin counting by putting <laughs> satellite images and then have school children all around the country counting penguins, we do, sort of, which so will help them go to sleep at night? Too. Exactly. In collaboration with with Oxford University, um, this is. Uh, we, we have a Zooniverse project um, where you can penguinwatch.com, which will allow you to, to count penguins from not satellite imagery, but drone photographs or camera traps that we have. Something else to do, folks. Exactly. <laughs> um, but we do, for those of you that are birders and, and might be familiar with eBird, um, we are partnering with eBird to make sure that eBird checklists from the Anna Antarctic are morphed into our models that are in penguin maps. So, for example, if we want to know where are chin straps breeding, um, you know, 40,000 tourists certainly beats you know, uh, our scientists in terms of coverage. And so that's critical to knowing where, where these species are breeding and where they're not. And just not just the penguins, but also all the flying birds as well. So those, you know, birders that go down um, and that are willing to put those checklists into eBird, that really does get pushed into Penguin Map. I want to thank um, Heather Lynch for an oh, extraordinary window into part of the world. Um, thank you. It was terrific. Oh, my pleasure. Um, that's it for Science on Tap for tonight. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you very much to the Stony Brook Yacht Club and to all of you who came tonight, and we'll see you again soon. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.